back now to Dr. Dennis McKenna, and we were talking about uh, plants and the fact that they were here, and I said, well, no commandments against uh, interacting with the plants, or as you p pointed out earlier, having a relationship with them. Uh, we have, it's been a co-evolution. The plants have been here probably before the, the walking things, uh, but we're both here, and uh, they're here to be used or looked at or admired or perhaps chewed on, or I, I don't know, what is, what do you think is intended for human beings and plants? Well, again, you keep using this word intention. I, I don't think anybody is running the show. I think that this is sort of an organic process that's going forward, uh, you know, um, evolutionarily. Uh, the thing you have to understand about plants is that they're very different than animals. Um, I mean, that seems like an obvious statement, but uh, one of the ways, and the way that they interact with the world and experience the world is very different than we do. Um, one famous botanist made the statements that plants have substituted biosynthesis for behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, what he meant by that is that plants, because they can photosynthesize, uh, they, don't, they make their own food, and as a result, they don't, have, they don't have to go foraging for food because they can make it from sunlight and carbon dioxide and water. One of the consequences of that is that they make a vast variety of chemical compounds. They are virtuoso chemists. And in the same way that uh, animals interact with their environment through behavior, through the famous fly, flea or fight reaction, sure. these sorts of things, uh, plants interact with their environment through chemistry. And they communicate with other organisms in their environment, bacteria in the soil, fungi in the soil, other plants, insects, birds, other animals that may feed on them, and human beings through these chemical messengers, through these molecular messengers. And uh, the molecular messengers, uh, if you know, speak in a you know, figurative sense. They speak to organisms on many levels. They happen to also make chemical messengers that resemble our own neurotransmitters. And, uh, you know, that's where it gets interesting uh, for us yes. for this particular topic, because then you're talking about plants that literally talk to you. And, you know, they don't say anything, but they, you know, when you ingest them, their neurotransmitter-like chemicals interact with your neurotransmitter systems, uh, you know, and you get some very interesting, um, you get some very interesting results. And I, I think in a, you know, in some sense, you... You know, you're seeing the world kind of the way they see it. I mean, I don't say that they use these neurotransmitters for perception, but this process of, of chemically mediated coevolution between plants and and humans and and all organisms, uh, you know, is a concept that I think needs to be explored. Um, you know, there is a, a field of uh, of science called chemical ecology which is basically this is the territory we're in here, the way that chemical systems are used to mediate relationships between organisms. And, uh, you know, it's a two-way street. Uh, the plants, you know, we largely value plants, if you think about it, for the chemical compounds they contain, whether they be nutrients or, uh, you know, cellulose, which are fibers that go into textiles yes. or... You know, or medicinal compounds that we may use, or, or um, yes. these more neuroactive type compounds. Or, as you said in the beginning, nutrition. And again, then, I proffer the word intended, because whether it's a plant or an animal, these are um, all things that uh, uh, co-evolved with us. And, right. and e even the biblical scholars will say that the plants and the animals were put here for our use. Now, you, you can take that or not, but, but intended does seem like a, a reasonable word to me. Well, if it's intended, I guess the question is, by whom was it intended? Oh, we uh, could have a conversation about that if you want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is, is it, you know, is it God that's, you know, 
running the show, or is it is it you know dome headed beings in geosynchronous orbit, or <laughs> or is it Gaia? I mean, I'm more comfortable with the Gaia notion that the whole biosphere is in some sense an organism. You can think of the yes. you know the entire biosphere. I mean, it's really a mega organ organism or a super organism, and just as in a cell in the body, all of the processes of the cell between, say, the, what's going on in the nucleus and what's going on in the cytoplasm and on the membrane, that's all controlled and coordinated through chemical messengers that are shuttling back and forth from the membrane to the cytoplasm to the nucleus and, and so on. The same thing is going on in the biosphere. Uh, it, it, the biosphere is permeated with chemical messengers. Absolutely. And many of them are made by plants. And, and plants are very good at it. I mean, they use these molecular messengers to uh, establish relationships with all sorts of organisms in the environment. Well, that uh, makes a war. Insects, for example. Insects are probably the primary example. Okay. Uh, plants depend on insects for their pollination uh, in many cases. And the insects, of course, get benefits from the plant in the form of nectar and, uh, and pollen, which they collect as food sources. So it's a symbiosis, this notion of a symbiotic relationship which has been very extensively studied between plants and insects, not so extensively studied between plants and humans, but that's the that's the key term, I think, that you have to uh, you, you have to come at it from that angle. What we're looking at here is a plant human symbiosis that has uh, impacts on the plants and impacts on us. So then a war on plants is really screwing with mother nature. It well, it's a really misguided idea. I mean, yeah. what gives us? We're only one species in the biosphere. What gives us the right to, you know, decree that some other species, because it happens to be a plant that produces a chemical that, uh, you know, our society has not been able to come to terms with, do we then have the right to decree that... Uh, uh, you know, this particular plant should be exterminated from the face of the earth? I don't think so. I mean, if we okay, were talking about an ethnic group of humans, this wouldn't be tolerated. Okay, then instead of, uh, the, uh, bearing in mind the fact that we cannot come to terms with it, instead of going to war against it, how do we come to terms with it? How do we come to terms with it? Well, for one thing, Again, going back to making a distinction between plants and chemicals, I think that's part of the part of the thing. Uh, you know, and you say, okay, if you want to grow marijuana in your backyard, if you want to grow mushrooms, if you want to grow opium, even you know, we don't care. Whatever you do as a gardener is not of concern to us. We're going to focus on the harder drugs, the drugs where there have to be infrastructures of of creation and distribution and you have to have you know that's one aspect of it and then the other aspect of it is simply education i think you have to give people the tools to make informed choices about number one whether to use drugs number two if the answer to number one is yes i want to use drugs the second question is which drugs are you going to use? Mm -hmm. And the third question is, how are you going to use them? Mm -hmm. You know, and this is the problem with the war on drugs and the whole uh, the whole dialogue is there's this big scary category called drugs. You know, that all things are put into. Well, there are drugs and there are drugs. There are many different types of drugs, and it seems that the you know the drugs of the that. You know, the, the drug warriors have set up this big, you know, scary bugaboo called drugs. But, of course, they don't include in that, you know, the drugs that they happen to favor, which are, you know, tobacco, alcohol. These things are also drugs. Sure they are. So I think we have to have a more rational dialogue about the subject. And we have to stop scaring people and, and try to give them, you know, the tools to make informed decisions. It all comes down to education. And it's like saying, well, you know, you don't have to use drugs to have a full life and, and to have a completely fulfilled life. You know, if you make that choice, 
fine. If you do choose to use substances, know, you know, be careful about which relationships you form with these substances and the circumstances under which you use them. It's no different than forming relationships with people, you know. And Andrew Wild said all this years ago in his book, The Natural Mind. I mean, nobody, you know, nobody listened then. Nobody's listening now. But that is the solution, you know. The, I mean, you know, nobody wants their kids to go out and get messed up with drugs, uh, uh, you know. And But the key thing is, uh, you know, if if you promulgate what is essentially misinformation, I mean, let's not put too far, find a point on it. Let's call it lies. Kids are not stupid. They're going to find out. Mm. And then, mm. you know, they will disregard what you say. So they say, well, you know, you lied about marijuana, so mm. you must be lying about heroin. Been saying that for years. And they've been saying that for years. Yeah, nothing Why makes not me angrier. Why not have a reasonable uh, debate? I know. I know. know. I know. I, I, nothing uh, through the years has made me angrier than the lies that are told about marijuana because, of course, they then cause the young people to uh, just go right on up the chain. And before you know it, uh, uh, the cops put them in the back of a car with, with crack cocaine and then off they go, part of the system, in jail. Yes, that's right. I mean, the, the laws that are designed to control the drug problem are having a worse impact than the problem itself. Mm -hmm. I think Jimmy Carter said this. If that's the case, then we need to rethink this whole dialogue. And uh, in terms of the psychedelics, I think that you know they do need to be used in a ritual context or in a fairly structured context. And, and the use of guides or more experienced people who you know can can kind of uh, structure the experience much as it goes on in shamanism and shamanism is really the model i don't think we can you know i don't think we can reproduce it but i think we can take a few pages from that book and try and implement it and i can envision you know in a more rational society uh, a situation where there would be a place or there would be a center where one could go and have these experiences and it would be legal and it would be uh you know it would be beneficial to people uh, we are not now that rational nor are we even close uh, no. uh, how far in the future if you can just sort of stand back and observe uh our progression socially how, how far in the future do you envision something like this might be a reality well it's hard to say i mean it's 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 really, it's really very hard to say because I don't see... I mean, I think that the people, uh, as almost always, the people are way out in front of their government on this issue. You know, most people feel that marijuana, that medical marijuana, for example, should be available to people that need it, to people that have diseases or chronic problems that, excuse me, that, that this could help. Uh, I think most people feel that rather than being put in jail, people should be given access to treatments, uh, you know, as their first option. There have been propositions passed in California to this effect and a couple of other states. So the people have a much more reasonable approach uh, to the problem than the government does. Uh, the problem with the problem is the government is tends to be slow to change. Uh, and, um, you know, there's also a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. Well, for example, I mean, the, you, the, you mentioned Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people thought that when Jimmy Carter became president, uh, there'd probably be a move to legalize marijuana. Well, lo and behold, didn't happen. It didn't happen. Then people thought, well, next time we get a Democrat in office, it'll happen then. Lo and behold, didn't happen. Right. Because, again, I think this is a, this is a function of the fact that it's very hard for politicians to come out on this issue uh, you know even if they do feel that it's misguided anytime you make a statement that is uh, you know in the least perceived as being pro uh, pro drug you're vilified i know uh, you know this is the problem and and politicians as a group are not a particularly brave brave That's right. bunch of people i mean their decisions are based on uh you know, what they think is going to get them reelected. And there is such a vocal uh, anti-drug 
majority or minority actually i think it is a minority but they're very vocal and so you know um, if you say well maybe maybe we should take a different approach then immediately uh they're pounced upon well and doctor, no I, I, rational I, I, conversation is possible doctor i lived in a state where there was a rational moment i lived in alaska uh -huh. when the uh, alaskan supreme court struck down the laws against marijuana and it became legal to have uh, to grow your own plants and to have i i can't remember an ounce or two for your own personal use mm -hmm. and that uh that was a, it was a great success for a while in alaska but then all of a sudden from washington dc they came rushing in and all conversation stopped the drug war was in full force and alaska reversed it all mm-hmm mm-hmm so well it, it, again this is this is sort of the irony uh you know the current administration and the uh uh you know the position of the conservatives uh traditionally is get government off people's back and what i actually think they mean is get the government off corporations backs <laughs> uh you know put uh i mean when it comes to what we do in our bedrooms or what we put in our uh, bodies or how we handle our reproductive choices uh, you know these regimes are very uh, you know very much totalitarian they want to control that kind of behavior they think it's very much their business and uh, you know this is where the conflict is i take it you would consider yourself politically a libertarian i'm not no i'm not a libertarian i mean i i about the only thing I agree with with the libertarian agenda is the notion that these substances should be regulated in a sane way. No, I think government has a a place in people's lives. I, I, you know, I'm basically a oh, liberal, yes. I guess. I think government should be concentrating on helping people and, uh, you know, making people's lives better. If you pay taxes, why not get some benefit from it? Uh, I mean, what bothers me is that my taxes go for... You know, the war in Colombia, uh, which is not being talked about in the media and is a war, uh, you know, or the missile defense system, you know, this completely absurd technological boondoggle that most of the experts say will never work. I mean, these are the things that I would rather not have my taxes spent on. <laughs> uh, well, I agree with you completely, uh, although you're, certainly your view uh, with regard to these substances is very libertarian. And yeah. uh, and you say otherwise you're a, a liberal, which would uh, which mean that it would generally mean to a lot of people that you want government involved in your life in a lot of areas. But not in my personal life. I don't want them telling me, you know, I I want them to be concerned with the public health aspects of drug of drug use and all of these other things. But I don't really want them to say, you know, if you smoke this herb or if you <laughs> drink this plant, you're going to jail. And I think, you know, it's just absurd. Um, I'd rather have them uh, giving, a, you know, a more uh, intelligent level of support uh, to that sort of thing. All right. You know, I would very much like to allow some of the audience uh, after the break to ask you questions if you're up for that. Uh, sure. Are you? Okay, good. Um, stay right there then. My